Don't you cut it out. Hmm? You keep saying thanks. I hate that word, thanks. Don't mean nothing. Don't mean nothing, huh? You try making a living with that word, you find out. I used to park cars in Nash's. Big fancy hotel. The fella give me his car and I'd say thank you, sir. Here, I was doing him a favor, but I had to say thank you, sir. And the louder I said it, the bigger the tip. And that figures. That don't figure nothing. You gotta be Charlie Potatoes, a man with the money. Then you don't have to bow down to nobody. That's the way I'm gonna live. Even when he didn't give me a tip, I still had to say thank you. That word got like it was sticking needles in me every time I said it. That can happen with a word. You know what I mean, boy? Yeah. And I got a needle sticking in me right now. Look, Joker, don't call me boy. Why, you're just too sensitive, man. I'm too nothing. That's right. You're too nothing. That's right. But I got a little advice for you, man, because I like you, man. You got to take things as they are. You can't keep fighting them unless you want to be unhappy. I see you got a lot to learn, boy. Like you living in that fancy hotel. Yeah, like me living in that fancy hotel. You think they're gonna let me in that fancy hotel, too? Oh, sure, they're gonna let you in that hotel. Through the back door if you got a pail and a mop. And you through the front door just long enough to collect your tip. Hello, folks. This is the Beef Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Gary Hill. And uh, with you tonight is a, a small reunion of sorts that I'm, I'm proud to host. Uh, one of my co-hosts tonight is Iris. How you doing, girl? Hello, and hello to you. And, uh... Yeah, her, her 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 tag team partner, well, well one of oh, one yeah. of four of the Theme Warriors. I have a half Theme Warriors reunion going on tonight, and I'm proud to say that Mr. Venom is here. How you doing, sir? Greetings and salutations, movie lovers, and yeah, thank you very much for having me, Gary. Uh, it, it's wonderful to work with, both with you and Iris again. I you have no idea how much I missed working with Iris. Oh, so, I yeah. miss your voice. Oh, thank you very much. I miss your opinions. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, what about the voice, dude? Come on. Well, of course. <laughs> I, I think we all have great voices here. <laughs> That's why we're on radio and not TV. <laughs> <laughs> that that hairy gut alone will keep me off television. I'll be okay, though, you know. It's a, uh, <laughs> but I'll uh, ask our guests the same thing I ask all our guests. Uh, what you been watching lately, Mr. Venom? Lately, um, obviously, with Fresh Cuts and us doing an episode every week, I try to watch the newest stuff that comes out. So I, I think the latest thing that I watched recently was a Spanish vampire movie that just dropped on Shudder uh, called uh, To All the Moons. It's a um, it's a very artistic vampire movie. Um, it, it's probably – it's not going to make a lot of horror genre fans happy. It, you know, it's not the most action-packed. It's not gory. I, in fact, there's very little blood in the film whatsoever. It's de definitely more of a conceptual piece. But um, it's actually really, really well done. And if you can handle slow burns, which, of course, I love my slow burns, then I would recommend To All the Moons. And, of course – um, being a film out of Spain, uh, usually we would expect the film to be in Spanish, of course, but in this particular instance, uh, the film is in Basque, which is a very, very isolated oh, language oh. in northern Spain. So uh, w when I heard that it was a Spanish vampire movie, I, of course, being a Spaniard, got very excited. But within one minute of the film, I'm like, what language is this? I have no idea what they're speaking. And yeah, I had to look it up. They're speaking Basque. So yeah. Oh. That is uh, to, uh, All the Moons is the name of the film, and uh, that is available on Shutter currently. And yeah, I, I would give it a recommend if you like the more artistic, uh, you know, more conceptual horror. You know, definitely metaphor filled. You know, like not a lot of uh, visceral uh, action or horror on screen, but a lot of implied horror. So yeah, check it out. Nice. So it's not full of a lot of the, th 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 th, but it's more. No. Of, <laughs> it's a lot more fluid. You could you could say that it's a lot more fluid without having a lot of that red fluid that we all love. Oh, all right, then I'm gonna have to check that one out. Anything else, Venom? Oh God, uh, let's see. <laughs> Another Spanish horror film that uh, we did uh, in the weeks previous is called The Wasteland. This one is available on Netflix. Um, this one is a little bit more traditional horror. It's um, about a family living in war-torn Spain during the turn of the century, you know, right before the Spanish Civil War. Uh, they're basically hiding from the horrors of war. But, of course, you know, the moral of the story is you can't hide from war. And um, this one actually has a legitimate creature that's actually haunting this family. It's basically a mother and a son 
who are living alone in the uh, kind of like a prairie, a very desolate area. Hence the title, the wasteland. Like it's not a forest. It's it, it's like a almost like a savanna type thing, but with less vegetation, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, uh, once again, another artistic. This, uh, like I said, this one is still very artistic, very metaphor filled. But this one actually does have a tangible creature in the movie. You know, that's not a psych out. Like there's actually something there, and um, you, you get a pretty cool. Um, climax with this one, very action-packed, very satisfying in my opinion too. So uh, yeah, once again, The Wasteland, uh, another Spanish horror film uh, from, uh, this one's from Netflix. So yeah, if you've got Netflix, I this one I would give a slightly stronger recommend to only because I think more horror fans will gravitate to this one than they would All the Moons. Like I said, that one being so artistic and such. So yeah, The Wasteland, big nice. recommend from Mr. Venom. And I wrote both of them down. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. And then, of course, you know, the, the big stuff that's come out this year, of course, with Scream. And um, and then this week we have Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which uh, I have already seen. I got I was able to get a screener. Unfortunately, I, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't really talk about it. But we will be reviewing it on the next episode of Fresh Cuts. And that drops this Friday also on Netflix. So. Um, it's Texas Chainsaw, folks. I mean, even the bad ones are worth watching. So <laughs> I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't say much more about the quality of this one, but uh, check it out. That's all I'll say for now. <laughs> okay. But yeah, just lots of horror, Gary. I, 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 I really got to, because of my wife working nights and weekends, I'm left to my own devices most times, which is why I podcast so much and watch so many movies. But Unsupervised, then I, huh? Exactly, yes. And I tend to gravitate towards the more vile of cinema and uh, so, because I don't really want to watch that stuff with my wife. My wife, unfortunately, is not a degenerate like I, like I am. She's not a horror fan necessarily. She, I think she more tolerates it for my sake because she knows being on so many podcasts, I have to watch these films. But um, with tonight's films, actually, she was thrilled to watch them. You know, just the fact that I didn't have to force her to watch some gory horror film. So, yeah. Uh, she thanks you, I'm sure, for that. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Lady Iris, what you been watching, girl? Well, I've been watching a lot of, uh, again, junk TV. Um, I did watch, well, I'm going to be watching um, The Eternals here pretty soon. Um, I did see House of Gucci. Mm. And let me tell you something. I fucking love the movie. Adam Driver and Lady Gaga were just amazing and for this movie to get snubbed by the academies the way it did uh, it just pisses me off but we're not gonna go there um and then uh hopefully you'll be watching the eternals this weekend nice uh let's see i've been doing a lot of the uh the boba the book of boba fett and mandalorian been trying to catch up on those and uh started watching yellow jackets and i have to say i'm in episode two I really like it. It's my kind of flick. Or it, yeah, it's kind of like a show, you know? Uh, like It's mm -hmm. got like eight, ten episodes, something like that. But I'm really liking it because I've always wanted kind of like a second part to The Lord of the Flies of <laughs> where are these kids now? What are you doing? And this is exactly what this is. This is a girl's version of Lord of the Flies, but we have an epilogue of okay, this is what the girls did, but now this is their lives and how it has played out because of what they did. So, uh, yeah, very, very intrigued with this one. I've been watching a lot of true crime stuff. Uh, but yeah, besides those two highlights, that's basically it. Yeah, I'm also caught up on all the uh, Boba Fett and uh, Mandalorian stuff. <sighs> it... it, it, it... It's so good when seven-year-old Mr. Venom gets to come out because when I'm watching these shows, these are the closest thing to like a true Star Wars experience we've gotten in decades. And, right. And my God, I mean, what the Mandalorian did for Boba Fett in season two, I will forever love John Favreau. I mean, I, I, you know, I, not to say I ever disliked John Favreau. But it seems like everything he's touched over the last 10 years is absolute gold. And like I said, the fact that he was able to bring back what was, you know, mine and many Star Wars fans' favorite characters, uh, well, character, and make him an absolute badass. Not just a guy in a suit who says a line here and there. 
even though that was enough for most of us to call him our favorite character in the original mm -hmm. trilogy. But yeah, what Favreau and Fellini have done uh, for both Boba Fett and the Star Wars universe in general is just unheard of. And yeah, I applaud those gentlemen and everyone involved with those shows. I mean, thank you so much for letting seven-year-old Mr. Venom come out and enjoy some new Star Wars content. Uh, it just, exactly. I, uh, love I agree with you so much. And what, what gets me is that all of these little... Uh, some so-called fans are like, oh, no, 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 that's not wrong. That's wrong. That's like, okay, you guys were in your daddy's nutsack <laughs> when these movies came out. Yeah. So shut the fuck up. Okay. Your opinion don't count. Leave us Gen Xers alone. Exactly. Yes. 10 year old Mr. Venom spent his own money to go see Empire Thank Strikes you. Back in 1980. Thank you. First movie. I, I, I literally saved my allowance for three weeks anticipating opening week. So <laughs> yeah, for a 10 year old to save money to go see a movie, I, I think that speaks volumes to this franchise. So yeah, exactly. So all of these little cis whatever is they need to <laughs> just shut the fuck up. This is yeah. th these are our movies, not yours. Just <laughs> go sit in the corner somewhere, okay? <laughs> uh. <laughs> but just my opinion. <laughs> hey, did you finish Book of Boba Fett yet, um, Iris? No, not yet. I have not finished it yet. I think I need like uh, three more episodes, and I have two episodes of The Mandalorian. So I want to finish all of Mandalorian first, and then I'm going to go over and finish the other. It leads into the what's going to be the next season. Uh, I'll give you that. Uh, that hint. That, that's that's what's going on there. And see, I'm so excited. Okay, all right. Let's hurry this along so we so I can get started. On it's, it's some, <laughs> and one of my favorite characters that I got pissed off they got shot. You know, it's, 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 I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little happier now. Let's put it that way. And just, uh, <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> my list is a lot more a lot, a lot a lot more meaningless than the list you guys gave probably. Because I, I decided to watch uh, t Terrible Life Choices WWE Pictures Action Movies this week. And oh. I said, I, I rewatched The Condemned with Stone Cold Steve Austin because there's not many good Stone Cold Steve Austin movies. And this one is good, but it needed somebody to take him back and say, let's turn this hour 54 minute movie into an hour and a half movie by cutting out <laughs> some of the filler. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's good enough. It's, 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 the, it's, um, the most dangerous game done again for the 150th time. Oh, but, God. but this time it's on the internet, y'all. So y'all can watch them kill each other. And uh, <laughs> that's the plot of The Condemned. They get, they get eight or ten convicts and they put them on an island. And one has to be the last man standing. And Stone Cold, of course, was ex-military. So he's, he's going to be your star and your last mm -hmm. man standing. And it comes down to him and Vinnie Jones, of course. And... This doesn't spoil this people. This is what happens in this movie. You knew it was going to happen in this movie. You seen the oh, cover. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've seen the cover of the, the movie. You knew it was going to happen. Uh, um, then I, I decided to watch The Marine with John Cena, which is follows that hour and a half long, you know, action movie, you know, construct, if you will. But that has a lot of dull <laughs> parts in there. But I, I, I mentioned, like, Children of the Corn series, it has those character actors in the movie to make these guys look good. Cause I watched five of these Marine films. There's one more I have to watch. I haven't, I haven't gotten to it yet to, uh, cause the last one was so bad. I was kind of like, Oh, what's, what's next. But, uh, <laughs> get these character actors in these movies. Like, uh, Robert Patrick is the bad guy. And the first Marine, Michael Rooker is the, the army guy who helps Ted DiBiase jr. Who plays the Marine in the second movie. Uh, Neil McDonough is the bad guy in, in part three where the, the Miz, uh, Mike, Mike Mazarin, uh, takes over, uh, people know him as the Miz. I do. I'll, I'll call him it all day long. And he's in four of those movies and they, they do their job by making these schlubs who aren't great actors look good. You know, they, they do this all the time. They put these low budget mm -hmm. movies and, and they, they, they make them look better, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll say out of all those movies, besides, you know, John Cena just, you know, selling it as an action star. I'm really surprised he hasn't done more movies as an action star as of the Marine. I know it's not a great movie, but he has a lot of the, a lot of the beats, a lot of the, you can tell he did a lot of his own stunts and it looks really good. He looks mm -hmm. good as an action star. Um, but Ted DiBiase Jr. I, I think is the, the, the most believable one out of the bunch because you can watch him 
and you could tell he had training by military people, like how to hold the gun and do certain things. And because uh, when you get to the ones with the Miz, <laughs> he's like holding the gun all limp wristed, shooting at people and hitting them. I'm like, that's that's not gonna work. You and I both know it's not gonna work. You know, and uh, I, I know Iris is a is a Tom Cruise hater. I'm a Tom Cruise apologist, but. The, the Miz is too goddamn small. <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle. The Miz is too goddamn small to be an action star. I'm just throwing out there. He's in four of those movies, and I sat through f- five of them all together. And I'm like, I think, wow. um, yeah, that last one I watched. This is the problem. The last one I watched, he he becomes an EMT who answers a call to this guy who got shot because he decided he was going to kill this bootleg Sons of Anarchy gang. This leader, and uh, he's in the parking garage of this amusement park. Now, if you're in a, uh, an amusement park, clearly with the ride with the rides that work, why wouldn't you use that in your action picture? The the amusement park, they they didn't use it at all, and that just seems off to me. I, I don't know. Really? <laughs> maybe they didn't have permission, huh? I guess it's just, it's just it's, it's, insurance, it's, maybe. It's like a waste, yeah. though, you know. <laughs> True. Um, besides that, I, f- I finished, speaking of John Cena, I finished Peacemaker today, season one, and if you're not watching it, it you need to start watching it. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I had the same conversation with a friend of mine who, I was that guy that couldn't get, was at season, at episode three, and I'm like, am I going to keep on watching this for this last episode? And then I got to season four, and then I was all in. So, if you're on the fence <laughs> after a couple episodes, and keep going it gets very funny and very interesting and james gunn is doing the whole next season uh writing and directing it himself looking forward to all that because nice. um it's fucking delightful it's it's, <laughs> it's 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 dirty and john cena becomes believable as an action person and and uh, as a character i say bye bye about episode two and, and i think it's uh all the people around him that really build him up um the, the vigilante character, especially when he shows up, but that's I think all bets are off. I just they're just they're just great like a great great buddy characters and uh, <laughs> he has a pet eagle who hugs him in the in one of those episodes. So they of go. course yeah. yes that's right. I haven't finished the series yet. I'm probably I'm probably right where you said the turning point is like right around episode three. So I'll definitely keep plugging away at it. Yeah, I, I recommend it again. Re- reunites it with Robert Patrick, who's. A racist piece of shit who plays his father on the show, and you know, it's it's really good though. I I I I, I implore people to watch it, and I would love to do a recap episode of this show talking about the first season, and uh, I, I should get some some comic book minds on this because I I've never read any of these books. People tell me that it's nice tributes to the books. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's about it for me. Um, Oh, it's, it's hot garbage, you know, those fucking Marine films. I, I don't apologize to myself. I apologize to myself, not to you guys, though, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should apologize to yourself. Ma- maybe a little bit. It's one, <laughs> it's one of those things right over where I was invested. I was like, I watched, okay, I watched the first one, I watched the second one, which I know are good. Let's try this one with The Miz, which is like a walking tall movie, the third one. And then l- let's see where it goes from there. And then I, I got to the, the, to the fourth one, which is still okay. But then you get to the last one where the gang leader looks like Rico Suave and he just won't die. <laughs> oh, I was like, no, you got to go. All that's missing is you're not wearing a t-shirt and just wearing the, the leather jacket or the jean jacket, whatever it is, you know. That's, <laughs> no, just just kill him. <laughs> don't, that's don't, my attitude, exactly. Don't, don't kill the Miz, though. He's, he's, a good, he's, a good, he's a good wrestling personality, just not a great action star. <laughs> um... Yeah, tonight uh, we invited Mr. Venom here to, to talk with us about two films and which prisoners are chained together uh, and escaping their, their captors. We're doing The Defiant Ones and Black Mama, White Mama. Um, mm-hmm. The Defiant Ones, of course, stars Sidney Poitier, who's not with us anymore, but accomplished many, many things. It, if I mentioned those many, many things, he'd be here for, for three hours, and he's had that deep of a career as a producer, writer, I mean director i mean during this time alone he made a lot of ballsy pictures you know guess who's coming to dinner a, a couple i never heard of i was looking up i was like I, I gotta watch this movie something where he's like interviewing like a nazi sympathizer or something i like i, I gotta watch this movie it's him and Bo- bobby darren the singer is the nazi sympathizer wow <laughs> <laughs> um 
Yeah, many, many things. And uh, Tony Curtis in that, and Black Mama, White Mama, of course, stars Pam Greer. And I, I forget the other woman's name, but Sid Haig shows up looking fabulous, and <laughs> Vic Diaz looking sweaty. We'll talk about all these things, man. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's Margaret Markov. Okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We'll start with the Defiant ones, and you'll hear about us talk about that. Yeah, that's some bad English right there. After the trailer. Go on, tell me all that big talk about Johnny Potatoes. When the chain's off and nobody chasing you. Come on. You can't, can you? You can't because you're nothing. You're not even a man. You're a monkey on a stick. That cracker mob back there, they pulled the string and you jumped. I'm a strange colored man in a white south town. How long you think before they pick me up? Get off my back. I ain't married to you. Now, what do I care? Come on. You married to me, all right, Joker. And here's the ring, but I ain't going south on no honeymoon now. We going north. Time's gonna come, Joe. The time's gonna come. Go on, burn your eyes out. Can't go lynching me. I'm a white man. I'll tell you the kind of white man you are. And I'll be Charlie Potatoes. Charlie Potatoes coming down the street. No more yes. <laughs> The Defiant Ones, the story of a Negro and a white man linked to each other's lives by four feet of hate and a steel chain. They were chain gang fugitives running away from the law and from themselves. It's a motion picture experience you won't forget. See The Defiant Ones. The Defiant Ones from 1958. Uh, your sheep of plot synopsis is this. Two escaped convicts chained together, white and black, must learn to get along in order to elude capture. Uh, this stars Tony Curtis. Uh, that's that's Jane Belize's daddy, in case you didn't know. Uh, <laughs> Sid, Sidney Poitier. Um, other notable actors in the film. Because they're kind of all over, all over the place. Uh, Theodore Beichel's in this movie. Lon Chaney Jr. shows up, shows up in this movie. <laughs> Cloud Atkins, who I, I've known in from about 100 Westerns, shows up in this movie. Mm -hmm. And if you've, if you've seen The Curse, uh, the 80s movie with Will Wheaton, he shows up in that movie as a... Yeah, it gets hilarious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Carl Alfalfa Switzer shows up in this movie. Yeah, that 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 Alfalfa from Little Rascals. Um, Does he actually use Alfalfa in his name? It says it in the IMDb credits. Because I've seen I've seen him use it in multiple credits on films where Alfalfa is his middle name. Like, he, did he like legally change it or something? No, I think it says Carl Switzer in in the credits. I think, but okay. on IMDb <laughs> they they choose to say Carl. Uh, in, in parentheses, Alfalfa Switzer. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what you know him as, goddammit, you know? <laughs> that, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, this is directed by Stanley Kramer, who's given us many di directorial efforts that are worth a goddamn. Um, Judgment at Nuremberg. Guess who's coming to dinner with Cindy Poitier again? Um, mm. Inherit the Wind, uh, just, just to name a few. <laughs> Um, we'll start with our guest on this one, uh, Mr. Venom. Uh, I, I, quick question, have you seen the film before, and what's your thoughts on it, sir? This is not a first-time watch for me. I have seen The Defiant Ones before. It's just been uh, since college. I actually watched this uh, movie in a film course, in an uh, African-American film course, believe it or not, uh, back in college, and uh, which was back in the <clears throat> 90s. Yes, I'm old. Shut up. Um so yeah, uh, this movie is, I'm not a stranger to this film, um, but watching it this week, man, just what a, just a refreshing time it was to see this, to see this performance driven film. I mean, Tony Curtis and Sidney Poitier, I, I, just to name the main actors, 
do a spectacular job with their characters, their dialogue, their line delivery. I mean, this is, I mean, I can call this an Oscar winning film because guess what? It is an Oscar winning film. It was nominated for best picture. Unfortunately, it did not win, but it did end up winning for best screenplay. And it makes sense because this story is spectacular and just as poignant now as it was in 1958, uh, I guess. Um, but on this rewatch, like I said, um, the, the beautiful cinematography, great camera work, really good score. But just the, the thing that really struck me was were these performances. Um, I, I thought Billy's mom uh, played by, what's her name? Uh, Cara Williams, who just recently also passed away uh, right at the end of 2021. Uh, I thought did a really good job as Billy's mother. She's not a likable character, mind you. I, I, I don't think she's meant to be a likable character. She's a, she's a misunderstood character, definitely. But I, I still think she does a spectacular job with her role. Um, Sheriff Max, you know, obviously the gigantic heart that he shows throughout this film. Um, and he has no reason to. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like they really tie in any kind of previous relationship between the sheriff and these two individuals. But somehow, right from the beginning, he sees them as human beings. It's not a black man and a white man that we can just shoot on sight. I mean, in fact, he does not want anyone from the posse to shoot on sight. He wants them brought in alive. And I think that says a lot for a lawman in 1958, because it's it could be just as easy, especially an elected official, which they made a point of in the film, is that a sheriff is an elected official. He's, the, you know, it's, it's not a uh, public service uh, position. So he literally has to impress his constituents to be, you know, voted back in the office every two or four years, how, however long that term is. So just watching his decision making as the movie goes along, watching how, no pun intended, defiant he is against the state policeman, uh, the state trooper who's basically trying to take over the, the hunt for these two and, and just watching those interactions alone, just it, it just makes me absolutely adore this character. So yeah, Sheriff Max, spectacular, but... I mean, what can I say about this movie that hasn't already been said? It's just, it's so great, so poignant. One of the things that I genuinely love about this film is that they don't really push the black and white thing nearly as hard as you think they might. This is a 1958 film, you know, we're in the middle of the civil rights movement, or at least at the beginnings of the civil rights movement in this country. And... But they don't push that here. They don't push any kind of political agenda. They don't push any kind of socioeconomic agenda. Uh, it's just two men who just happen to be chained together, who through, you know, an odd situation are able to escape and get out of, you know, uh, captivity. Unfortunately, they're chained together and their story goes along from there. But yeah, the fact that Tony Curtis never goes full-blown racist at any point in this film is very refreshing, you know, especially for me, for those who don't know, my last name is Cortez. I am a minority and my parents lived in Connecticut during this time period in the 50s and 60s. And the stories that they told me about, you know, the injustices and things like that, that they had to deal with just as Spaniards, not even as like, you know, black people or Asians or whatever, just as Spaniards. I mean, ultimately, a Spaniard is a, a, a Caucasian European. You know, I'm 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 whiter than most white people. But of course, you know, being a Cortez, I am a Spaniard. I look at myself as a minority. And um, so I tend to look at these movies through those eyes. And this movie was so refreshing because I remember the first time I watched it in college, I was fully expecting it to be just a N-word fest left and right. And ultimately, you can count on one hand the amount of times the N-word is used in this movie. And once again, that's very refreshing for me. So um, just to cut this off before I go rambling on for another hour, uh, this is a film, this is a must-watch film for me. This is a film that I think all people need to see. White, black, Asian, doesn't, it, even if it, if, even if you're not interested in race relation issues, this is just a great film with great classic actors, um, you know, directed by a, you know, an auteur of cinema. And I, I can't give this movie enough recommendations. I absolutely love this film. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that for now. <laughs> cool. Iris. Yeah, this movie. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, first time I watched this movie, I was in high school, and it was a sociology class. And, um, you know, it was it was very, it was a stunning movie for me then. 
And, you know, every time I watch this movie ever since then, it's it's still stunning. And, and basically for the very same facts that Venom has basically said, you don't have a lot of, you know, over the top racism. You don't have over the top hatred. Basically what, you know, like you said, it wasn't a, like it, it's not a movie about race issues. It's not a movie about black or white issues. But it sure is a wom- a movie about human issues, about how two humans from totally different views of life start coming together to work as a team, one, because they connect physically, you know, they've got the chain on. <laughs> mm-hmm. And second, they start to see a lot of similarities within themselves and uh, how they were raised or how they grew up. And they start to understand each other, even though their worlds, especially in 1958, were a complete dichotomy from each other. Especially when they started talking about, you know, at the when you know that fancy hotel, and um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Cullen says, "So where do I fit in? You know, where do I fit in this? Well, uh, you'd be using the back door, right?" And then Cullen comes back, and I'm like, "Oh yeah." Well, you're collecting your tips, right? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> nice comeback, nice comeback. But you know, and and it's just so it's very poignant, I I'd have to say, of the 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 way this movie looks at two men in a fucked up situation that need to work together. And it basically it shows if we put all our differences aside, we can do great things. You know, and, and these guys did. They they were the shit, you know, like when they're trying to get out of the hole, the big old mud pit that they fell in, mm-hmm. had it work together. You and you can also see that they start caring for one each other. You know, Cullen's like, dude, that that red's infected. We, we need to do something for that. Cullen was always looking out for um, for Joker <laughs> or Johnny mm-hmm. Potatoes, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so he's always looking out for him, and then in the end. You know, Johnny does the same for him. Mm-hmm. And Johnny puts himself in such a precarious position that, you know, Cullen, Cullen could have gone north and just, you know, whatever, dude, sorry, run faster. Um, but he didn't because that was his buddy. They actually became buddies. And um, in the movie, when, when I was in, in high school, there was a lot of jeering and a lot of the jocks were like, oh homos and stuff like that but you know it it it, it saddened me then and it still saddens me now because what you're seeing are two grown men who are very comfortable showing that they care for each other and not you know (laughs) and nothing else and people do tend to see that in such a wrong way and i'm like again this is a movie about human issues of how we as humans need to you know just stop thinking about each other so differently and just work together. And and that's what I love about this movie. And it's, um, especially at the time it came out, 1958, you know, Um, I'm sure that this movie was probably not shown in some cities down South Mm -hmm. because of uh, the subject. And another line that I love is like, well, what a white guy and a black guy got chained together. (laughs) Sheriff goes, yeah, well, the warden has a sense of humor. (laughs) <laughs> I thought it was just unlucky numbering. That's, that's funny that he came up with that. But I mean, you know, I'll accept it. <laughs> yeah, it's got a sense of humor. But yeah, and you know, the sheriff, another character that I really, really enjoy, not on the screen for more than 10 minutes, is Sam Long Cheney Jr. Ah, yes. Right? So Long Cheney Jr., obviously the old man of, of, of you know, the old company man is basically what he is there. Uh, you've got these young bucks who are like, oh, look, we got ourselves a black guy. We're going to lynch him. Woo-hoo! And what he says at the end, it's so like, <laughs> sounds so weird. But I was like, oh, he had a Jesus moment because that's exactly what he did. He was like, so are you going to burn him? Here, go ahead, burn him. Mm-hmm. Are you going to lynch him? Here's a rope, string him up. You know, and that is another another part where it's like, these are humans and they understand each other because they have similar trauma, not just experiences, but trauma, similar trauma that all three of those guys had went through. 
And that's why he could understand. And that's why he basically saved these guys. Yeah. And again, I, I, I totally loved that with a single shot, we got an entire backstory of Lon Chaney's character. Mm-hmm, exactly. A single shot of his arm tells you everything you need to know. That that's that's great filmmaking right there. It is. It is. It really is. It can, like you were saying, the cinematography, the uh, the soundtrack, everything in this is just so well put together that I'm really surprised that you know it didn't get more than more Academy Awards than it did. But there you go. <laughs> I forgot to mention, you know, one well, multiple stars of this film. That I, I the, the, those beautiful hounds that show up in this movie to find them. Oh my I, God, yes! I just want, I just want I to like rub the Dobermans. The, I just want to rub their jowls, those hounds, like, for for days. Aww. You know, <laughs> for days is adorable. <laughs> um, they were overworked. Damn it! Hey, man, he was that's con- right. He concerned for them dogs. That's good shit too. You know, because you don't get that in a movie where he, that's a uh, yeah. Yeah, the relate the race relations in this movie. I mean, it, it starts out with them, you know, going at each other before the truck, of course, flips over and that they make their 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 escape. And even past that, they were still at odds. But I, I like I said, it, it's it's really nice how in '58 you, you watch this movie and you could you could see how they you could get together, how they'd be controversial, and even in the end, you know, because the whole the whole thing, mm, especially the ending, yeah. The whole thing predicates that if the, is this, is this train still running or not? So the whole what if you know, and they did the train is still running and he's on the train, okay? Um, Cullen, Sidney Poitier's character, is on the train, and this is after our friend the, the, the Johnny has been shot by by the the the, the, the house friar who I think was just looking for some loving. I, I like to know more of her her. Uh, oh God. Actually- her I think back. it's Billy. Isn't it Billy that shoots him? Billy yeah, shoots Billy. Yeah, yeah. But still, I, I think that, I don't know, I don't know what's going on with her. Maybe her husband left her some time ago and, because she seems like she ain't had a man in a long time because she was all over, or all over Johnny and uh, she's had that, those dreams of, oh, he's, he may be a piece of shit, but I can run away with this man and they're not looking yeah. for a man and a wife and, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of in, in you know, like the, the Bugs Bunny cartoons where, the, those weird looking females were like, it's a man. Yep. <laughs> yes. She got very she excited. Was a, she was a hard character for me because I, I found it very odd how easily she'd be willing to just abandon her child for this guy that she just met last night. It's like, yes, Tony Curtis is handsome. Okay, he's charming. Yes, he can talk any woman out of her panties. Okay, I, I'm fine with all of that. But the Some fact that this do. woman literally just, uh, her husband just left her a few months ago, I think eight months, I think she says in the film, and and then she's willing to just dump her kid at her brother and sister's house in Cumberland to run away with a uh, an escaped convict. I'm like... What, what is the motivation here? Like, I mean, aside from sex, I, I can't see anything. Because she's even talking about selling her the farm. She's like, oh, we could sell the farm if we need money. It's like, whoa, is Tony Curtis that handsome? Am I missing something? Well, he is kind of, but, you know, also the stigma <laughs> of um, damaged goods. She that is, is a woman true. that she was a woman that was basically abandoned with a child. So for her to get back that societal status of not being damaged goods... Mm-hmm. she would have to remarry or have a guy, right? But then, especially in those days, um, you wouldn't marry a woman that already has a kid. True. So she would have to dump the kid on somebody, find herself a man, and then go, oh, by the way, I've got this kid. <laughs> you know? And depending on how the guy feels about it, you know, he'd come in or not. But I think a lot of that was also showing the social stigma of, how women had no other recourse but to basically jump on whatever man's wagon. And that's basically what she's doing. Also, she wants out of there, man. She wants out of that mud, slog, awful place. She wants the big city, you know, that's that we can go dancing into the restaurants. The kids standing right there. And I'm like, Oh fuck, man, (laughs) not a conversation I have right now, but yeah, you know, that's, that's another thing that, that this movie showed so beautifully without slapping you in the face is this stigma of these abandoned women, which at the time there was plenty of, 
Mm-hmm. Well, you're definitely right that they didn't slap us in the face with it because I wasn't even thinking about that at all. But that is a 100% valid point. Uh, I wasn't thinking about the stigma of a divorced or, you know, well, yeah, a divorced woman with a child in the 1950s. So, yeah, I I still like I said, that one line about her dropping her child off, you know, to run away with a convict. It was just that line that rubbed me the wrong way. It's like, I I, look, I understand we got to take care of our own happiness. No one is responsible for our, our happiness but ourselves. But you have a child. And once you have a child and this is coming to you from a child, this individual, folks, I have no children. I will never have children. Um, when you have a child, your life is no longer yours. Your your life now belongs to that child. You live and breathe for that child. So the fact that she was so willing to just give them up to get another ring on her finger, you know, like I said, it just it rubbed me the wrong way just a little bit. But, you know, it's not like I it's not like the character was a complete loss necessarily. She did do some good in the film. Um, but, yeah, I was just questioning that. But your your explanation is 100 percent valid. So I can accept that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Even when she's talking to the police, she's not really saying much about where they were going. <laughs> right? She's like, one day that man's yeah. going to come exactly. back and I'm going to get that D, God damn it, you know. Exactly. <laughs> mm hmm. Somehow, maybe she had this little fantasy of like, okay, she's going to get Cullen to the train, and then he's going to come back, and we're going to take off. <laughs> yeah, something but like even, that. Even at I that guess, point, yeah. though, that was, uh... were they getting the car started, you know, to, to, to leave, I guess, and he, he, he still doesn't want to leave his friend. The guy, he's, he's been, you know, wading through the river with these chains and getting out of that fucking mud hole with, and been through all this shit, mm-hmm. they, they become boys, and even to the point where... When they first meet, um, what's the little boy's name? I forget the little boy's name. Billy. When Billy. they first meet Billy, and Billy's got the gun, um, he's he's sauntering over to 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 to, to Johnny, because you know, ooh, a black man, that guy's gonna hurt me. And he tells him flat out that this this guy <laughs> won't hurt you. It's like they, they had that foreign brotherhood that they didn't have when they first interacted, and in, that we've seen in the movie, mm-hmm. and um. It's all there, and I, I could appreciate that in a movie from 1958. I mean, a couple of years before, he made Blackboard Jungle with Glenn Ford. I think it was like his first thing ever, and he's very young, and the race relationship between him and Glenn Ford, you know, a black student and a white teacher, was really something. This is a couple of years before this, and mm. I, I, I really dug this, and I, I first I ever, I, this first time I ever watched this movie before, I, I, I've heard it before, but, you know, one of my favorite movies... Of all time, and it's, it's it's a modern movie. Is oh brother art thou? I could turn it on any day of the week, and the the idea of them they were chained <laughs> together for a long time in that movie. But the whole idea of the the, the prisoners on the run and their their um their adventures and it, it, that's a lot more whimsical mm-hmm. than this movie is. But um I, I dig it, and the the, the the whole yeah yeah everything was mentioned. <laughs> and the, the conclusion is 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 open ended because you know. You know, do you hear the dogs? Yeah, you know, because they're they're again. Iris said there's gonna, there's, Iris said there's going to be that that group that says, "Ooh, they're gay," because you know, he he was on the train, then he got off the train, then he's holding his friend who got shot in a gay way. Ooh, that's that's fucking gay. You know, no, yeah. they just, just it's his brotherhood, no. you know, on screen, and they're they're waiting for their fate. You know, will will they get shot by the wrong cop? And you know, because. I think uh, it was pretty big in this movie. They they mentioned their infractions, you know, when they start to look for them. And black men in a, in a chain gang for a minor crime, you know, not not uncommon today. Not not chain gang, but you know, it, it's in prison for minor crimes. You know, it's uh still happens, you know. But um, mm-hmm. it's 1958. They they made they made sure you know in, in a movie like this, and where it's probably not a popular thing to to mention. To make you feel sympathy for for the the black lead, but uh, they 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 do it real well in this one, and mm-hmm. I can appreciate all that and uh, the the real life settings because you know this isn't this isn't computer time. They're really walking through that river and they're really trying to get a freaking mud hole and and I I, I love their whole journey and all, all the way to the end. And, uh, yeah, it's good shit, y'all. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And it's like, one scene I'm that sorry. I didn't talk about. No, um, what, just one quick scene that I didn't talk about that I wanted to point out because I absolutely adored the scene. I actually rewound it uh, yesterday to, to watch it a second time. It's the scene where they're eating the bullfrog out in the woods and they're talking about animals. And they're oh, talking yeah. about how some animals are loud and have no... Uh, like sense of safety, like they're just being loud and basically giving away their position. Whereas other animals that are quiet are either fearful of being hunted or they are the hunter. And I, I, I kind of like that because it almost seems like Tony Curtis or, or Johnny is basically saying, I'm a hunter and you're because, you know, because Noah Cullen is singing throughout most of the movie. He's making noise. So I, I almost felt like he, it was almost like a backhanded um, insult, like, a, like almost like a secret insult. Like, you know, I'm a hunter and you're obviously a prey. So how about you just shut up? But he never does tell him to shut up. Like he has multiple opportunities to tell Noah to stop singing throughout this film. And he never does it. So I'll, I will give him credit for that. Uh, maybe he's a music fan. I don't know. But uh, but that conversation specifically about those animals and how some are quiet and some are loud and how it kind of fit Noah and Johnny's characters, too. I thought that was a really poignant scene that a lot of people don't really discuss. It's a quick one. It goes, it's like a minute long. It's a quick conversation. Uh, it's part of a bigger conversation. But just that one little part always struck me as really poignant and like um, almost like a major part of the film that just a lot of people kind of gloss over. So I wanted to point that out because I, I just love that scene. I love that whole conversation. Ultimately, there's not a conversation in this movie I don't like. I mean, even the long conversation that Johnny and Billy's mother have after Johnny wakes up, um, you know, after his injury, um, that's a long scene. Like, I mean, I, I was looking at my clock after a while, like, wow, they're still talking. But ultimately, it's not dull. It's not boring. It's just there's a lot of information being exchanged there, you know, about New Orleans and gr women and everything else. And and then, you know, Billy's mother's past with her husband and everything else. So there's a lot going on in that scene, but it's just a dialogue scene. So uh, it, it's a, one of those scenes that I think people might tend to mentally check out, but maybe miss some vital information. So, yeah. This movie is filled with conversations like that. Just little conversations that don't seem important. But if you peel back some layers, you realize, yeah, there, there, there's a lot being said in these conversations. So I just wanted to point that out before we moved on. Oh, that's fine. Um, Iris, any final things you want to talk mm -hmm. about? And what do you give it one to ten? Okay, so first and foremost, Sidney Poitier can't sing. Uh, <laughs> Bowling Green! So is Machine! Uh, 11 stitches, man. <laughs> uh, so, I, I have to give this movie a 10. And um, first of all, it's, to me, this movie is Hollywood canon. If you consider yourself a cinemaphile, you absolutely, positively have to have this movie somewhere in your repertoire, somewhere in your resume of saying, I am a cinemaphile. You need to have this movie, and it needs to be, well, hopefully it's near the top somewhere. Um, the lighting, everything in this movie was just so spot on. Um, the atmosphere, everything. It's, it's just so there, and these are two characters that within an hour and a half, you are so completely invested in that you are really hoping that these guys make it. Uh, so, yeah, this this movie is a 10 for me. Cool. Then um, final things, and uh, 1 to 10, sir. Uh, I mean, what can I add to this that hasn't already been said? This film is, it's beautiful, it's brilliant, it's heartbreaking, it's it's heartwarming. I mean, you can. there's so many adjectives that you can attach to this film, and all of them would be valid. Um, it's... It, it's just such a tour de force for me, you know, I mean, for, for being a film that um, some people might expect there to be a little bit more action, you know, more running from the law and more fist fights and things like that. It's a very subdued film, but uh, its message is incredibly powerful without, as Iris mentioned earlier, slapping you in the face with its message. Um, at no point are you, you know, 
pissed off at the politics of this film. You know, they, they don't bring up politics at all. As I mentioned earlier, they don't bring up socioeconomic issues. They don't bring up, you know, race or color more than maybe in the opening conversation where they do drop the end bomb once or twice. But like I said, for the majority of the film, you're not, you know, bombarded with that word, which is, you know, nice <laughs> um, for, you know, especially for someone like me who basically cringes every time he hears that word. So, um, Absolutely must watch, as Iris said. As Iris said, uh, just this is this is absolute canon. Must be watched. Uh, it, obviously, it's an it's won two Oscars. It's an Oscar winner. If you're a fan of you know high art, you know cinematic masterpieces, I, I would go with this one. I'm still not going to come in with a ten, only because my tens are very hard to come got, come by. Um, I, I guess basically the easiest way to put it is I'm kind of an asshole when it comes to giving out tens, but I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm solidly giving this movie a nine point five out of ten. It's it's a must watch in every way, shape, and form, and especially today with everything that's going on today with politics and the pandemic and race relations, this movie speaks loud just as loudly today as it did in nineteen. 58. So yeah, this is a high recommend from me. Absolute 9.5. And you know that you said that? It makes me very sad because this movie is still <laughs> you know, it, it's still there. Yeah. And it's fucking sad. <laughs> I, I don't know that it's ever it's a terrible thing to say. I mean, I love my country as much as any other American, but I, I'm also a realist. And, you know, based on our history and everything else, uh, I, I think re race relations is something we're going to be dealing with for as long as there's humans on this planet, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. And, you know, and it's not just here. I mean, it's everywhere. Oh, yeah. It's in every country there is. It's just we as humans just we're so cliquish. It's true. You know, it's, it's just sad. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, a couple quick facts on the film uh, an uncredited technical advisor was brought on board filming um, because he was a real life chain gang escapee who was still a wanted man so that was something nice oh, dude nice um, Tony Curtis insisted that Sidney Poitier received top billing on the movie so that's a uh, that's, that's a real sense of brotherhood right there too that's awesome it's it's Tony, man. I mean, come on. Man, mm -hmm. go the young man uh, with the transistor transistor radio was played by our gang Little Rascals graduate Carl Alfalfa Switzer. This is Switzer's final screen appearance before his untimely death in the shooting incident. Uh, yeah, read read the history of our gang and see how many are left and why they how they died and it's it's really fucking tragic. Mm. It is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my gosh, where's the. Uh... <laughs> Elvis Presley wanted the role of, of John Joker Jackson, hoping to to, to, to co-star with Sammy Davis Jr., who was the first choice for the Noah Cullen role, but was persu persuaded by his manager not to do the film. Uh, the, the Colonel, I take it, would be that ma manager. Um, mm -hmm. Which, I, I don't watch trailers, but when I heard Baz Luhrmann was, made, made an Elvis film, I watched it today, and I'm very excited to see it. Let's put it that way, you know. <laughs> um... There's some other good stuff on here, too. I don't want to go nine years on this, but I, I did enjoy my first time view. It's going to be a multiple time view uh, of this film, and it's 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 pretty perfect, pretty flawless. But um, I'm going to give it a, a lower rating just because I, I didn't catch everything. But you can, you can catch this film on Amazon Prime to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a subscription. Um, I'm going to give it 8.5 out of 10 just because I, I didn't catch everything, and I want to watch it again, and... That, that rating will probably raise higher, you know, with um, more viewing. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, there's no reason not to watch this. It, it's, it's, it's terrific, and go, go check it out, you know. Uh, but next yep. up, we're going to talk about uh, some, some, some fancy exploitation action, which uh, we, we all love, I'm sure. <laughs> um, with 1973's Black Mama, White Mama, right after this. There are none more dangerous than those who have nothing left to lose. That's cool. Women in chains. A thousand nights without a man. A thousand reasons to kill. Women in chains. From a hellhole of twisted passions to an inferno of flaming gas.
chains of hate kept them bound together. Hounded by every love-hungry brute on the island. See, I don't like cops, and cops don't like me, so why should I help you? Ten thousand reward. Women in chains. We're going the wrong way. We've got to get off. It's the right way for me, baby. If you screw up this deal for me, I'll kill you. Desperate and dangerous. Women in chains. Black Mama, White Mama, from 1973. Um, your cheap applause synopsis is this. A black prostitute and a white revolutionary must form an uneasy alliance when they are busted out of prison and are pursued by guerrillas, bounty hunters, and the army. This stars, of course, Pam Greer. Oh, this gets a 5.6. That's unfair. Uh, <laughs> um, Mar- Margaret Markov, um, Sid Haig, and... Probably his best wardrobe ever in this fucking movie. <laughs> oh, I love it so much. Uh, Lynn Borden is M- Matron Desmo- Densmore, our uh, lesbian prison uh, prison guard lady. Of course, she's a dyke. Why, why, why not, right? <laughs> why wouldn't I, she be? Of course. She, she's getting Every it in. Every prison needs one. She's getting it in. I ain't mad at her for uh, that, okay? You know? Wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can't pronounce this guy's name. It's all these... Sh- sh- what is it? Shormack. I'm gonna call him that. As Ernesto, Eddie Garcia shows up as who is Captain Cruz. You know, it's a fucking Filipino film. Vic Diaz as Vic <laughs> Cheng. Uh, yeah, he shows up in this movie. We'll talk about that. Oh, there's more people. Yeah. But this is directed by Eddie Romero. This is produced by American International Pictures. I don't think it's more Filipino action than that. Exploitation than that. <laughs> we'll talk about it right now. Iris, what's your thoughts, girl? Oh, okay. So, I mean, come on. You've got two gorgeous women. You've got prison. What more do you want? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, come on, man. I mean, a lot of people like to say this is a prison movie, but really it's not. It's it's not a, a prison movie to me in a sense of the perfect exploitation prison movies like, you know, the, the bird gauge and stuff like that. Um, but I like one of the things of this movie is same as the other one is the chemistry of the two characters. And you can clearly tell that there is a chemistry here with uh, Pam and Margaret and the, their little exploits to do. Uh, one of my favorites is the nuns. Mm-hmm. That was fucking hilarious. Those poor ladies um, <laughs> being that I work with nuns, you know, <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny, uh, but the story itself is really, really good. You think about uh, what was going on at the time in the 70s. You know, you've got, uh, you know, black powers going on. Feminism is also happening. And let alone, you also have numerous of little Latin American countries that are basically having the same thing going on, you know, the revolution. So I like how it takes all of that and just throws it, slings it all in one movie. And it's a lot of fun. First, you have. The two ladies, obviously, you know, the white pretty lady who's a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the black prostitute. Uh, You've got the lesbo who hides herself in the broom closet. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, I'd like to think that Porky's took a little bit of this movie and stuck it in there. (laughs) Because, wow. Um, And, of course, you know, there's plenty of nudity, plenty of Filipino so it, it's definitely a Filipino movie, but it's lots of fun, right? I mean, you've got Sid Haig's over-the-top American character who basically, wherever he walks, he is the rooster that rolls. When he walks into uh, those people's houses and basically cavorting with his daughters. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. It's one of my favorite parts there, too. Sid, and, and you're like, well... 
well, Mr. Sake, way to go. I mean, you know, in his underwear, you can clearly tell that the man's been blessed. Um, you know, his character, I love his character because it's it's kind of like he is so arrogant and but it's what I like to call permissible arrogance. He's arrogant because he has a reason to be. <laughs> And, and and he plays his character good. And then we've got Mr. Rapey Man himself, Vic Diaz, <laughs> and his character. I mean, his character is kind of like the greasy has been anthropomorphed, basically. It's really <laughs> is what it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> he is just that greasy, slimy dude. It's it's job of the hut. That's yes. who that is. Yes. He is the human version of Jabba the, because he does exactly what he... If he could have had one of the prostitutes chained to him, he would oh, have done yeah. that, right? Yep. Absolutely. Because, and, and, oh, if it's exactly who this is. Uh, so you have all of these wonderful characters, and, and they're never forgotten. Every single character in this has his own place. Now, like, you know, and a lot of people is like, oh, you know, it's just a Filipino exploitation movie. No, it's not. It's a great vision. And you also have to remember that the story, Jonathan Dem, he won a fucking, uh, he won a, a, an Oscar for, I believe it was, yeah, Sons of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't just like, you know, people that didn't know what they were doing. This was an actual, I think this was very well thought out. Because not only do you have the feminism of these these two women that are just they're kicking ass, but you know you have this beautiful black powerful woman with this gorgeous afro, and she's getting shit done, you know. And then you have this the the what, what you know what black exploitation movies like to call the white savior, but not really because she's also got her shit going on and and all that. So I don't know. This movie to me is always so much fun and. I've actually even introduced Victor to this movie. <laughs> His mom's terror. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is fun. It's really not that bad. I mean, yeah, you got a bunch of tits. We we, we fast forwarded through that part. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, it, it's a fun ride of a movie. It's constantly moving. You really, really don't notice that it's 87 minutes. You know, it, it's just like boom, 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 boom. Everything just moves along. There's not a lot of filler. And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes this movie so so much fun and intriguing. And God, I I don't know how many times I've watched this movie because it's just fun. It's just absolute fun. <laughs> uh, Venom. All right. Well, this is a first time watch for me. I had I've always heard the stories about Black Mama, White Mama. Um, obviously Pam Greer is a legend. It's not like I haven't seen many of her films already, but this one just kind of slipped through the cracks for me, but man, yeah, this was a really fun time. And uh, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bringing race into it, but uh, again, I'm so shocked how this movie didn't lean on the white birth versus black thing at all. I mean, in fact, these two women are some of the least racist women that could be chained to each other that you could possibly find. Like, they never really get into any kind of racially charged discussion of any kind. Um, you know, they're in the Philippines, so they're both strangers in a strange land, technically. So um, it's not like one has kind of home field advantage, if you will, kind of like with the Defiant Ones and Tony Curtis's character. So, yeah, I found this to be so incredibly fun. And Sid Haig, uh, holy shit, what can you say about Sid Haig? Um, for a second, I thought this movie was called Sid Haig and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Blouse. <laughs> because, wow, that first shirt that he wears when he's playing pool, that is an epic shirt. I mean, that's an epic shirt even for the 70s. Like, that, that, that oof. That shirt is so 70s, it's just, uh, it's out of the stratosphere, man. It, it was just so amazing, so colorful. And he wears it with the confidence of an absolute badass, which is exactly what Ruben is in this film. He is a badass, and deservedly so. But the nice thing about him, too, is that he's not ultra-hateable. Yeah, he's an asshole. Yeah, he's overconfident. 
uh, because of his lot in life and everything else. But he he's not necessarily hateable. Like I found myself smiling every time he was on screen. And yes, admittedly, you know, I see a little bit of, uh, you know, Captain Spaulding in there every time he opens his mouth. But, you know, that's just kind of, you know, association more than anything. But um, yeah, great performance there. Um, I'm going to say this this movie wasn't as fun for me. I, I will agree with Iris that the pacing is really nice that, you know, for a, for a movie that's under 90 minutes, uh, you almost don't even notice it go by. Like it literally ended. And, you know, when one of one of our main characters passes on, I was just like, whoa. Uh, and then the movie ends and it's like, oh, shit. OK. Uh, I wasn't necessarily complaining. I was satisfied with the ending. Obviously, you know, just like with the first movie, we wanted to see both of them, you know, kind of get away and get free and everything. But obviously not every movie can have a happy ending. But for whatever it's worth, this one is still a really satisfying ride. Um, I, and man, what can I say about Vic Diaz? I mean, man, Chernobyl, Pat Lorre, uh, Peter Lorre, excuse me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean... He, that man commands your attention. If he's on the screen, he is 100% the center of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, just his his charisma. And I know, you know, I, I use that term very loosely because I know that term is kind of usually reserved for the more attractive of the species. But despite, you know, his appearance, his confidence, obviously he's a drug lord. So, you know, of course he's going to be, consider himself the smartest man in the room and the most powerful man in the country, blah, blah, blah. But just something about the way he carries himself, he looks like a, just a fat toad, you know, blob guy, but he's still carries himself with such confidence that it's very obvious he is the boss. He is the drug lord. There's no question there. Um, I am not... I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that I'm not the biggest aficionado of 70s exploitation. It's it's kind of a hole in my movie watching, uh, you know, over the years. So yeah, I, I've watched some of the big ones, but I, I haven't really done a, a lot of extensive research into it. But this particular film, as has already been said, just really fun. Um, despite all the nudity, you know, I watched it with my wife. We were having fun just making fun of the what we call the male gaze 1973, which is what the real title of this film should have been. Uh, but <laughs> still, I mean, we still had a, because we're laughing at it, you know, the whole time we're just like, oh, like, like, it's one thing when women are naked in a shower scene. It's another, th you know, and, and then, you know, if they're naked in like a hot box, like, like in the torture scene, the hot box scene where oh, our two yeah, main that. girls are naked, which, yeah, by the way, mwah, thank you. Mm-hmm, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but then as we get deeper in the movie, the the nudity starts to get a little bit more gratuitous, especially when it's just women giving massages or just like in, in one scene with Vic Diaz, there's a naked girl just sitting on a chair smoking, but butt ass naked, just sitting on a chair smoking. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the male gaze right there. I mean, there's just literally zero reason for that girl to be naked other than to show another woman naked. And hey. Whatever. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't kink shame. Vic Diaz likes watching oh, no, naked, women, kink shame na anyway. na naked women smoke. You know, it could be a thing for him. I don't know, man. You know. <laughs> hey, exactly. I mean, See, hey, that's, that's the thing. and that's exactly what I meant about the human job of the hut. Yep. Yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah. All those women were his slave layers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very okay with that. But yeah, sometimes I, I will say that sometimes the nudity and exploitation films will start to like rub me the wrong way, only in the sense that it's taking me out of the film. Like like all the prison scenes, fine. Like for the first 20 minutes or so of the film where, where they're still in prison, all that nudity, it's like, that's expected. Okay, uh, you know, the, the, the warden masturbating in a cubby hole while she's watching her girls um, shower. <laughs> I can accept it. Fine. Oh, All of that. But, um, sometimes it gets a little heavy handed. So I am looking forward to kind of exploring this subgenre a little bit more and expanding my knowledge base on that one. Because like I said, admittedly, I don't watch. I've, I've just never really had the desire to watch a lot of these films. Um, I never really hung out with a lot of people throughout my life who watch these types of films. So I've just never really had the education in them. But um, for whatever it's worth, I don't regret the time I spent with the film. It was fun. It was quick. 
Um, you know, Pam Greer and Margaret Markoff were both great. I thought Margaret Markoff especially did a really good job as a revolutionary, you know, of, of kind of showing as little emotion as she could throughout the film. Like she she does smile here and there, or grunt here and there during an action sequence. But for the most part, she's very straight laced, um, you know, very um What's the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, uh, to the point, like all about the business, if you will. You know, she's she's not about uh, the treacle all around. So right. she's uh, extremely sectarian about the whole thing. That is a spectacular word. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I have very little complaints with this film, in all honesty. I thought it was fun. Getting to see 70s blood is always good. I love me some oh, yeah. 70s blood. That bright orange ass caro syrup. Absolutely adore it. Um the ending, like I said, is fairly satisfying. It's, you know, obviously a little bit more heartbreaking than our first film, but, you know, it, it kind of just goes with the territory. Like, the ending that we got for Black Mama, White Mama, was a little bit more what I expected out of the Defiant Ones the first time I had seen it. Like, the first time I watched that movie in college, I, I would have bet money that both of them weren't going to survive this movie. Like, a literally large amounts of money, I would have bet. But, you know, obviously, you know, we get a little bit more of a palatable ending, especially because it's 1958. So, you know, you, you don't want to necessarily kill Tony Curtis. But then at the same time, you don't want to have the director come off as racist and kill off Sidney Poitier. So I can understand the decision making there. Um, but, yeah, back to this film. Uh, obviously, as I've already said, had a really great time. Nice pacing. It goes by really fast. If you are a degenerate who loves these films, and not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with that, because I hope to join your numbers very soon, um, then this film should be right up your alley. I mean, there's nothing about this film that I can really complain all that much about. Good story, good pacing, great 70s score. This early 70s score is spectacular. You know, it's not quite, you know, super fly or shaft, but it is a spectacular score. It really is. Um you know, the, the the filmmaking may not be as on point as something like The Defiant Ones, something that was, you know, a big budget Hollywood film at the time, as opposed to this being a more, you know, a Filipino localized uh, uh, production. This, I mean, 20 minutes into this movie, I, I felt like this movie is so Filipino, Roger Corman's name has to be on here somewhere. Just somewhere. It's got to be on here. And it's not at all. I was shocked. But yeah, I mean, every other girl in this movie is Filipino. So it, 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 there's no denying where you are. I, I, obviously, about halfway through the film, we actually see that the police officers do have Manila police badges on. So that's kind of the dead giveaway. But yeah, just throughout the movie, I'm just like, wow, Roger Corman must be salivating the first time he saw this movie and thought, damn it, I didn't make this. What the hell? So, yeah, a uh, really fun movie. Like I said, not definitely not at the level of a Defiant Ones by any stretch, but really, really fun. And the fact that it is kind of a spiritual remake, if you will, the, very loosely based at least, um, I'll give it credit for that because the Defiant Ones, as we already said, it's a great story that needs to be told. And I'm very okay with getting a gender-swapped version of it uh, in the exploitation subgenre. I mean, it works for the time period, so... Um, yeah, really fun movie. Very glad I watched it. You know, I knew it was an exploitation movie. When they first get into prison and they enter the line, the, the ward, warden Logan says, okay, strip them and get them wet. Okay? <laughs> that's that's how you know you're an exploitation movie when, when somebody says a line like that. And, of course, the finger bang scene that follows. But, uh, anywho, your two female leads are, are kicking all kinds of ass to this movie. You got this... This woman, this Pam, Pam Greer, who's uh, was a uh, work for Vic Diaz, I take it, as far as the plot goes, because yeah. th during the whole movie, he he's like getting updates. Oh, they're they are here now, and they are there now, and she's getting closer. Like she's going to steal my money and all this fucking other bullshit. <laughs> Looking slimy. Like, yes, the job of the hut as a human being is Vic Diaz in this movie. I mean, there's a point in the movie. <laughs> I, I, I was I, I was posting something on Instagram with the watches for the, first, the first time we are going to do this show. And I was like, oh, my God. Some poor woman is licking Vic Diaz's belly. I bet it tastes like, <laughs> I bet it tastes like hey, it's been in the fridge too long. Oh, oh God. <laughs> that poor girl. I, I hope she got hazard pay. <laughs> that, that, Seriously. You know, that slide that comes out the hand you leaves it in the fridge too long, oh, you know? Stop. Just stop. <laughs> she was probably stop. picking the hair out of her teeth for hours. Oh, after. my God. Okay, I'm going to mute both of you. <laughs> 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 it is so disgusting. 
<laughs> That's what I thought when I'm watching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. You pay me enough. Yeah, nice horrible girl just hanging out with him, just you know, touching his parts and stuff. Oh my god, that that. Uh... But yeah, that idea of of her that mission. They both have a mission. They both have a mission to get out and do something. And uh, uh, Margaret Markov's character, she, she's going out to join her revolutionary friends who. Are I guess gonna go fight against the the the, the local police I guess and 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 Vic Diaz because they have a massive irresponsibly stunted uh, shootout at the end of this movie. I mean that, that's how, again how you know you're in a Filipino action movie is that the stunts <laughs> look real and they look irresponsible because uh, yep. <laughs> there's an explosion right next to Pam Greer's body in this movie and if you know anything about her. Right? At this point in career, she was doing like a majority of her own stunts. Right, so, I remember that. It's just like, God damn, that's close. You're watching it, just like, yeah, this would not work today at all. You know, out of film set, and and it's just <laughs> wild and irresponsible and stuff. Everything I love about the '70s in, in that scene, just fake blood and you know, not not Mexican Filipinos getting getting shot. In it, it's it's just a fun shootout scene and. But like the whole, their whole journey is a lot of fun. Like like Iris says, they they, they steal the habits from the nuns so they can <laughs> get on the bus undetected. It's it's little silly stuff like that, you know. Down to, you know, they meet the another sweaty fat fuck who has every intention on raping uh, the the the, oh. white, the titular white mama of this movie, and they they bump oh. him off after you know she she takes a chunk out of him. You know, yeah, that's our seventies blood. Oh yeah. <laughs> It, but the, the 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 chemistry, much like in, in Defiant Ones, is done really well. Uh, moves at a great pace, like like they said. You don't even know it's ninety minutes, like they said. And uh, Sid Haig, you know, people say, oh, it's like he's so charismatic in this movie. And there's a point in this movie where he's wearing like a cowboy outfit, like blue turquoise shirt, and uh, a, uh, an ascot <laughs> or a scarf it. around his neck. It. Oh wow! He's got that cigar hanging out of his mouth. If if you guys knew him. You know, for from from like conventions and stuff, he's a guy who who, who presented himself that way. He didn't give a fuck what mm -hmm. you thought of him. You know, he, he come there, he looks exhausted from the night before. He he's you know signing autographs for as cheap as anybody can on the floor, and still to this day, whenever I see Bill Mosley on, on the showroom floor, I I, I get real sad because I'm I'm looking for Sid, kind of exactly, like exactly, yeah, kind of like you know. <laughs> When a dog, their owner dies, and the dog looks for the owner all over the house, and he's not there. That's how I feel about Sid Hay, because he was that type of guy. And the, the guy that would pick up your, t take your cell phone and call ran a random number to motherfuck him. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen it happen, and the shit's fucking hilarious. I, I, again, everything about this man I miss. You know, from, you know, I watch stuff like this to where he's wearing these outfits and he's acting the way he does with a certain swagger and. I was like, "Yep, that said, this guy gives no fucks what you think of him." And it, it's exactly, it's, that. and that's what I call that permissible arrogance, man. It's yes. not, it's not acting though, guys. It's just it's just him. I, yeah, yep. right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why he's so charismatic in movies like this, and you know, I, I, I love it. And his character basically just lo looking for that hustle as the bounty hunter and working with the revolutionaries in a way he's working both sides. He's like, you got a job of the hut. You're Sid Haig is your, is your hand so low with this movie. He's, uh, <laughs> he's yep. looking to whatever angle he can work at and, um, uh, get, getting some, some Filipino boom, boom. Like I was said, <laughs> when that girl is riding him like a horse in the bedroom, I can't stop laughing. You know? Oh my God. That is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Dad's peeking oh. through the damn uh, peephole, and I'm <laughs> that's right. Get it, get it, honey, get it. You know? Oh my god, yeah, that was. I didn't know how to feel for that poor guy. I mean, obviously he's a criminal, so I don't really care all that much. But still, to, to have to listen to a guy rail your teenage daughters, uh, yeah, that, that's a bit much, maybe. But hey, funny as hell since it's Sid Hague. Great line, <laughs> Ruben said when somebody says uh, the, the dogs have been stolen. How are we going to find them now? Sid Haig, as Ruben says, well, asshole, why don't you get down all fours and I'll follow you? You know? <laughs> like, yeah, it's a, that's a amazing, the line, the line delivery. And mm -hmm. I, I, again, as, as an exploitation movie, as, as an adventure movie, this is, this, this there's more than a 5.6. And I realize <laughs> people would think that the plot is kind of convoluted with the whole 
because a lot of these films have that revolutionary angle in them. Yeah. And, but this one does it with a purpose, I think, because they're, they're both escaping out of jail with a purpose. They both have an intention on doing something to accomplish something. And it, it, it ends up, in, in the end, with, with that great shootout, the great irresponsible stunted shootout in, in the end of this movie. <laughs> I mean, watch it, guys. The last 20 minutes is ridiculous, you know. Yeah. But, but um, all in all, um, good time. It's probably the second time I watched this film, but it's been a very long time since I've seen it before. You can watch it on Tubi for free. Buy a nice HD print to watch on Tubi and uh, go uh, go check it out. I'll yeah. uh, kick it back to Venom. Uh, anything else you have to say about the film? And will we give it 1 to 10? I mean, you know, as I've already said, fun movie, um, first time watch for me. So I didn't really, you know, I tried to curb my expectations, especially when I'm watching a movie that's almost as old as I am that I've never seen before. I try to, you know, not expect too much out of it. And I think because of my lack of expectations, I end up liking older films a lot more than maybe the average person does. So, yeah, I had a lot of fun with this movie. And ultimately, any movie with 70s style penis shaming in it, I'm on board for it. <laughs> All day that long, Shane. That some so oh my, good. that was that scene. I I, I had to rewind it because I was laughing so hard. I missed some of the dialogue. Like I actually missed when they said four. Nah, three and a half. Like I missed that the first time. I'm like holy shit, that was great. So yeah, any movie with penis shaming in it is okay with me. So yeah, um, man. As far as the score, I mean, I don't. I don't really want to give this a score based on just general cinema because ultimately it's not really a general cinema type film. Um, it's not anything that would have gotten a large theatrical release in the seventies, you know, maybe some art house stuff in New York and LA and whatnot, but um, just, but I'm going to give this a score based on my limited knowledge of exploitation cinema. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to give this an eight out of 10 just for the mere fact that I had a great time with it. Like at no point was I really rolling my eyes. Like nothing was frustrating to me in this film. And that's a big thing for me. Anybody who listens to my shows knows how easily I'll get frustrated with a film or a certain character in a film or whatever the case may be. Uh, but this one, yeah, there was nothing really to get frustrated about. It was all fun and games, you know, um, gratuitous nudity, which who's going to complain about that. Um, some decent action. I, I'm not going to go so far as to say good, but I will say some decent action as, uh, as Gary said, some, uh, irresponsible, uh, set pieces throughout the film, but you know, that's the Philippines for you. Uh, but yeah, overall I had a really fun time with it and have no real major complaints. Like I said, until I broaden my knowledge of this subgenre, um, I have no major complaints with this film, really good time with it. So yeah, uh, I'm pretty confident with my eight out of 10. Cool, Iris. Um, I'm gonna give this a nine. I think I scored this as an A uh, when we reviewed it on uh, uh, BB and BC. Uh, but yeah, th this movie is lots of fun. Always, anytime I, 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 you know, want something just to laugh and have fun with, I'll throw this on. Um, and oh, who doesn't want to stare at Graham, uh, Pam Greer? I mean, shit, right? Woo. Um. But yeah, this is fun. Um, like I said, the story moves along. It, it's quick paced. If I want to just have 90 minutes just buzz by, I'll throw this on. Um, I never get tired of this. Never get tired of Vic or Sid, Pam or Margaret. Um, and like you guys were saying, explosions and things. And yeah, it's just fun. So yeah, uh, mine's a nine. One thing I love about Pam Gray's career is that she's never played the damsel in distress in anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit in Scream, Bilacula Scream, but she she was still very independent in that movie. And uh, I can appreciate that about a woman who ch chooses roles in a way to, to say, hey, because she started off pretty early, you know, in the, in the genre. And I think she, she established herself as a strong female character. I mean, not necessarily a strong black female character, but just strong female character. You watch films like Coffee or Foxy Brown. You, you can see stuff like Sheba Baby. You can see films like these. And you could say, you know, this is a woman who's who's sure of herself. And, and you know she's tough. I mean, she she comes from fucking ranchers. You know, she, right, right now she, she lives on that family ranch. And um, that's how you know she's fucking tough she's got, right there. Yeah, well, nice. she's got beautiful horses, man. Nice. Um, so I can appreciate a film like this. And... It's it's themes and not 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 going too far because it's really easy to go too far in a film like this and especially if it stayed in the mm -hmm. prison 
It did, but it really didn't really go in like too too many sleazy places. It managed to let the female leads kind of live a little bit and not be that damsel damsel in distress. And I I, I love it. I mean, I'm not saying hey, show your little girls black mama white mama tomorrow, you know, because they they might not be feeling that as as parents. But uh, you know, you know <laughs> Victor watched it. Victor's cool, you know. That's right. She, That's right. she she fast forwarded the finger bang scene. She's a good grandma. Yeah, we, we yeah. got we, we we went past that. We went past that. <laughs> we we started when when you know they're already out and and running. <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> you know, mom. Yeah. Wow, this movie's only an hour long. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. We cut out we cut out the good parts, the hot box parts and shit. You know and the. the um, well, oh, I got to We'll show him that later. <laughs> yeah, he'll see when yeah, he's older. Show him that privately. <laughs> Oh, that hot box scene! I'm sorry. Oh uh, my god! I, Isn't that... I forgot. I, oof, I forgot to mention how much I almost passed out watching Pam Greer, sweaty ass Pam Greer, walking out of that box. Wow, man! Oh, I know. <laughs> but, uh, Never I been so jealous of a hot box in my life. Um, Ooh, but boom, boom! That's what she said. Um, I am with Venom with the eight out of ten, though. I do enjoy it. I enjoy other Pam Greer films more. It doesn't really sully my my score on this film. But uh, mm-hmm. like I said, free on Tubi with with a couple ads. If you want to you like it, watch it. I think Arrow has the Blu-ray out. Go buy it if you like it. So uh, yeah, check it out. But um, nice. yeah, that's it for this one. And we're gonna come back out and close out the show. Are you sick of the same old stale podcast? Well, then join Vanessa and David as they dissect movies of all kinds. The two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites, curiosities, and first-time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room, where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on iTunes and where fine podcasts are available. They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or email them at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. And still, they just might be contagious. Get information or a pamphlet at most pharmacies or a health clinic. If you need help, see a doctor. Uh, Mr. Venom, thank you for coming on. Uh, we uh, we always appreciate hearing your uh, views on films as a whole, and I uh, I made sure I sat real tight in the seat because I knew you were going to talk a lot, and that's that's a good thing with you, man. <laughs> I tend to almost always end up apologizing in my guest spots because no. I I talk. I love to talk. I'm constantly talking. My wife is constantly telling me to shut up because I I basically <laughs> can't shut up. Um, and God forbid, if my wife actually was a horror movie fan, she would never get me to shut up because I literally would just not stop talking. But, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me on. This was an absolute treat. Um, you know, as you guys know, most of my shows are going to be horror movie related, um, with the loss of the uh, theme warriors in my schedule. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't really leave a lot of non horror to watch. So to be able to, you know, take a little break from the horror genre and check out a couple of great films. I mean, one of them damn near a masterpiece. And then the other one, just a fun ass seventies exploitation film. I mean, it, it was an absolute treat both watching these films and getting a chance to talk to you guys about them. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. This was a genuine treat. I look forward to doing it again. Yes, please. There's one thing we learned about Venom that he's a habitual rewinder. So that's turn off for you. You know, somebody just rewinding <laughs> films while you're watching them, you know? Yeah, uh, that's why I end up watching most of my movies alone. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife gives you that look sitting on the couch, uh, like, you fucking doing it again, you know? <laughs> What's funny, too, is that going into the film, like I said, it was a first time watch, so I didn't know much about it. And I told her, I think it's exploitation. And she's like, is there going to be a lot of titties? And I'm like, I, I would imagine so. I mean, it's a 70s film with Pam Greer. I would imagine there's going to be at least a few. But yeah, uh, some of her facial expressions at some of the more extended nude scenes in the film, absolutely priceless. So once again, I get to thank you guys for that. Nice. <laughs> well, tell the folks where they can find you, man. There's plenty of places, I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I don't do as many podcasts as I used to. I mean, I used to be on double digit numbers of podcasts back in the day, but um, my career, you know, my my software engineering career has kind of taken off in the last year or so. So I've been working a lot more, working for some, um, you know, major, uh, uh, working for a major company in renewable energy. So um, unfortunately, I had to step away from some of the podcasts that I was doing. uh, So I'm no longer on a few of those shows, but I still, you can still hear me on all of the No More Room in Hell shows. There are three of them total. Uh, The main show, of course, is No More Room in Hell. That is a bi-monthly, you know, horror movie podcast where we look at a couple of under-discussed horror films. Um, On the next episode, which will be episode 42, we're going to be looking at A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night and Thirst. Two very kind of, um, they're my Valentine's picks since it is the February, uh, you know, one of our February episodes. And I didn't want to do like, you know, the standard horror Valentine's Fair that a lot of people do. So I tried to dig a little deeper and uh, almost went with audition. But uh, unfortunately, that one has even been kind of over discussed over the years. So yeah, I went ahead and made those two choices for myself. So that'll be episode 42. That'll be available sometime next week. Uh, the next show is No More Room in Hell presents Fresh Cuts. That is the, our weekly show where we look at the newest genre releases. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our latest episode is the Spanish vampire film All the Moons. And our next episode will, of course, be Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2022. I don't know if this is part five, six, 27. I don't know. And I don't really care all that much, but uh, uh, that'll be our next episode of Fresh Cuts. And then the last uh, show under that banner is No More Room in Hell presents Creature Comforts. Uh, That is our creature feature podcast that I just started. This is actually my baby. I'm producing it. I put it together. So this is like one of the first shows that I could truly say is, you know, kind of mine. I got my little grubby little hands all over it. Uh, that's myself, Derek B. from Cinema Attack, and Donna Nelly from the uh, from the Horror Countdown podcast, and he's also on Fresh Cuts with me. That is a monthly podcast, so our latest episode is episode five. It is currently available. Uh, we looked at 1966's The Island of Terror, starring Peter Cushing. If you've never seen a blob with a giant pituitary penis before, check out that movie. It's well worth seeing. And if you want to see Peter Cushing become a Jedi at the end of the movie, uh, check that one out, too. So, yeah, that's the, uh, the Island of Terror from 1966 on episode five of Creature Comforts. And um, my other two shows that I'm still actively doing are In the Mic of Madness and Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. Unfortunately, both of those shows are on rather extended hiatuses right now um, for one reason or another. You know, just, you know, life just happens to us sometimes and we're just not able to get three or four people together on any given Sunday. Iris knows that. that Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Exactly. As we haven't done a theme warriors in a little while, as much as I miss Iris and Doug and well, Mike Merriman, I I talk to him every week, so I can't possibly miss him. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so those are the shows that you can hear me on. All of my shows are available on the Dark Discussions podcast network, except for Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. You can hear that one on the Legion podcast network, but all my shows are available anywhere you catch your podcast. So that's it for me, Gare. Iris, what's coming up on BBNBC? Uh, we are on a small hiatus right now. And uh, when we do return, um, the plan is to do Salem's Lot and Salem's Lot 2. You want those yeah, so, you want those I prefer? Uh, obviously, Salem, the first one. No, it's not. <laughs> Ah, oh, Gary! <laughs> you prefer I, Return. I, I, oh. I like I liked the first one okay. It's just the campiness of the second one. And that it's so Larry oh, Cohen, Larry. it's not even funny. It's just, oh. uh, man, it's so good. I don't know why. I love it so much, but, um... <laughs> that's valid, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Larry Cohen guy more than, so, yeah, you know... Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say that's basically where we're at right now with that stuff. So, and I have something in the works for myself... And I'm still trying to uh, kind of work out some of the details. But once that's done, there might be an extra Iris uh, podcast out there. Yay! I'm excited. Oh, I thought you I thought you were going to say you were, another Iris is coming. I'm like, you're pregnant? Oh, God, no. God, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. The crib. 
Yeah, the crib's still, you know, the playpen's there, but the crib's gone, so no. There you go. (laughs) I may have another project brewing that may may or may not be recording on Wednesday. I don't want to tell you what it is till it happens, because I'm I'm like that, man. I'll tell you what it is when it happens, but Mm -hmm. um, that's happening. Brand new project that is a thing is that episode's out there on the Intestinal Fortitude Podcast Network. That's uh, Android Android Virus's uh, podcast network. Mm-hmm. It's a show called Untapped Gems, where me and uh, the lovely Heather Powell from Friday Nightmares Podcast, we uh, we talk about films we haven't seen before. So, very first episode we ever did, and uh, the, 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 the whole ploy of the show is, is mutual. We, we haven't seen it. We did Don't uh, Lucio Fulci's Don't Torture a Duckling. Ooh. Ooh. It was a nice. fine conversation we're both proud of, so if you could head over there and go check it out, we'd appreciate it. Um, regular shows on Legion all fall under the Cinema Beef banner. Uh, two Jig Minimum commentaries record this Saturday and possibly Sunday, too. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm trying to get two in this weekend, but for sure we're doing <laughs> one on Saturday. I know for sure we're doing your... Um, uh, I forget the, the the rest of the certain of that movie, but it stars Red Brown playing the the, the, the Captain guy, America, Captain America himself, <laughs> k- kicking some ass in that movie. I'm I'm looking forward to doing that with uh, K- Cameron Scott and uh, Android Virus together. And um, nice. the, the second one to to fill your your needs is a double bill of, of your <laughs> with gore. So because why not? You know, makes uh, sense. Uh, Oliver Reed with a funky headdress on, and you know, and <laughs> Jack Palance making Jack Palance faces, and well, why mm-hmm. not? Why, why not a sword and sandal movie? Huh? It's a good shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's coming back. Last call, of torches we just released uh, the Forty Eight Hours episode, and the Demolition Man bonus review on Legion Patreon. If you're not there, you don't get those bonus reviews, obviously. But I, I think it's much more fun conversation than the Forty Eight Hours one. But I think they're both pretty good. Uh, Next uh, recording for that one should be Streets of Fire with uh, a bonus with Ralph Bakshi. Ralph Bakshi's Rock and Roll is going to be the bonus episode for that. Ooh. 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 Oh, I loves me some Bakshi. Uh, me too. Uh, so that's that's happening next for that. Um, other shows too. Yeah, Blood from the Core, Legion Patreon exclusive. Go check that out with myself and Derek. Next episode records soon for that. I'm leaving something out, and I forget what that is. Yeah, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Find find them all at those places, and uh, I'm tired, man. But I'm gonna leave it at that, and um, mm-hmm. en- enjoy that. Enjoy Legion podcast. So support it for your, all all your all your wonderful support, and um, Iris and Venom, of course, and uh, Suzanne, who could not be here tonight because she's still she's not down with the sickness. She's recovering from the sickness, so. Next episode oh. you should hear of this will be uh, our Peter Bogdanovich tribute that Suzanne has programmed. So she's got to show up for that, people, where we're doing tar- <laughs> yeah. we're, we're doing targets in the last picture show to, 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 to celebrate the, nice. the only man I could accept in an ascot, uh, Peter Bogdanovich, you know. <laughs> Rest in peace. Yes, indeed. So that and uh, we do we do fun stuff the month after. We don't talk about sad stuff. And uh, Good. If you if you, awesome. if you see uh, the the programming, uh, I'm gonna watch Suzanne. I'm gonna make Suzanne watch something stupid, and she's gonna <laughs> she's, she's gonna hate it. And uh, man, you know. But um, I'm gonna leave it at that and say this has been your Cinema Beef podcast. Where if you've got beef, we've got the grinder. See you next time. <laughs>